Good afternoon. I'm Richard Connor. I'm the publisher and owner of the Fort Worth Business Press. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar. We've got some great topics. We're going to look into the future. Things are very challenging these days, as we all know, and there are a lot of unanswered questions, but we hope that we'll provide some answers to all of you this afternoon. We've got some great panelists. Our moderator, Bob Francis, has been a journalist for a long time. And if he doesn't have all of the answers, he'll ask the questions. I wanna encourage all of you to ask questions as well. You can go to your toolbar to the question and answer um, bar and submit a question on chat and we'll get an answer for you. Uh, I'd like to remind you that the Fort Worth Business Press is just finishing its 32nd year as we enter year 33, uh, we look forward to the challenges and to continuing to be the premier provider of business information in Fort Worth, Tarrant County, and quite frankly, North Texas. I encourage you to uh, become what we now call an insider. Go to our website, www.fortworthbusinesspress.com. Sign up for our newsletters, go to our website, and become an insider and we'll give you an inside peek on all of the news, particularly business news about businesses and people in North Texas. At this point in time, I wanna turn the program over to our moderator and the editor, Bob Francis. Good afternoon and welcome to the Fort Worth Business Press webinar. I'm Bob Francis, I'm, as Rich just said, I'm editor of the Fort Worth Business Press. Well, after a year of tremendous change, unprecedented challenges, and hey, why not throw in a presidential election? How will state and national lawmakers respond when they meet in January? Well, that's the question uh, we put to our two panelists today. Uh, joining us are two speakers with experience in both political and financial worlds. Chris Wallace with the North Texas Commission, a public-private partnership that represents regional issues uh, both in the state and in the nation, and Kelly Hine of BKD, CPAs and Advisors, a national CPA advisory firm with major operations in Fort Worth. Uh, so thank you panelists for your time. They've got a good audience with us today. We hope you'll join us with, uh, pepper us with some questions. Let's start with uh, Chris Wallace. Uh, Chris, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, the North Texas Commission, and what you're hearing from your constituents as we enter the new year. Well, uh, Robert, thank you very much. And Richard, uh, you as well. Thank you for the invitation to uh, include the North Texas Commission. Uh, we certainly appreciate our partnership with the Fort Worth Business Press. Thank you very much. And Kelly, I look forward to working with you, sir, on this panel and, and serving with you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We, 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 we are, as Richard mentioned, in a very challenging time. Uh, and of course, the commission was formed 50 years ago to pull private and public sector leaders from all of our 13 counties together to address challenges, whether it was the need of a large uh, regional now international uh, airport, which is the economic engine for our region, DFW Airport, our big events, our economic development. Now it's legislative issues and state and federal uh, right now, it is all about COVID response and recovery, and we were happy to help take the lead early, early, early on uh, in the pandemic to pull, uh, together with our friends at the Council of Governments, pull all of our 16, uh, 16 county judges together, so three more than the region in which we serve at the commission, uh, together to uh, look at consistent messaging and policies uh, and benchmarking in terms of strategies across the entire region. This was prior to the governor's executive order. And today we're very proud to be pulling all the mayors together. And we're very proud that uh, Fort Worth's own uh, uh, outstanding uh, mayor, Betsy Price is co-chair of that council uh, with Mayor Rick Stouffer and Irving. And those mayors about 40 plus continue to meet every other week to talk about consistent messaging and strategies and practices in terms of meeting needs for continued response to COVID-19. So I applaud the public and private leadership from across this entire region. And I've been here now uh, right at two and a half years, came from the state chamber 
Texas uh, Association of Business in Austin. And uh, I'm very proud to be home. I'm very proud to serve this great region. So thanks for having me. And uh, what, what are you uh, what are you hearing from some of uh, those mayors out there? What are they telling you that they're concerned about? You know, uh, consistent resources, uh, consistent information. Uh, I think uh, with the distribution, uh, with the vaccine, uh, that's going to happen here very, very soon. Uh, I think that's going to, you know, certainly begin to help. But you know, Robert, we're going to be uh, several, several more months uh, masked up. Uh, we must wear our mask. We must practice safe distancing. Uh, and it's hard. It is very hard. And, and I know it's taken a mental toll on many uh, to, to have these types of virtual meetings uh, and, not, and not connect and engage together like we are normally used to doing. But that's what we must continue to do. We must continue to stay vigilant to make sure that we're all uh, safe. And, uh, you know, the health of our uh, citizenry uh, is uh, imperative for our long-term economic uh, recovery in terms of our economic uh, side. So, uh, you know, we must have a healthy population if we're going to continue to recover economically. That's, that's really in a nutshell what we're hearing is uh, it is uh, all eyes focused on that. And that's what we're seeing now that I'll talk about here soon in D.C., and what we're going to be seeing the majority of in the 87th session of the Texas legislature. All right, uh, Kelly, let's uh, turn to you. Uh, why don't, similarly, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and BKD and what, what you're hearing from clients and what maybe what you're telling your clients. Very good. I would like to echo Chris's thoughts to thank both you, Rich, and the business press for allowing me to be a part of the panel today. Um, and want to give some information first about BKD. Um, you know, I'm a tax partner here at BKD in our Fort Worth office. Uh, we're a national uh, CPA firm and have, <clears throat> pardon me, depending on the day you look it up, we're somewhere between the 10th to 15th largest CPA firm in the United States. For those of you who might not be familiar with the name of BKD, uh, our Fort Worth office was previously Rylander, Clay and Opitz, and we merged into BKD a couple of years ago and had been operating as the Fort Worth office of the firm uh, subsequently. Were, were uh, you with Rylander previously? Yes, sir, I was. I'm, I was a partner at the firm as well. Uh, and I've been here in Fort Worth about 15 years now. Um, but uh, we, the firm, serve, cli uh, serve clients across a variety of industries, uh, you know, serve both business clients as well as individuals. For my uh, direct practice, I work with individuals and their owner-operated businesses, so I do have the opportunity to see both the company side of things and then how that impacts the individual partners and shareholders in those various entities and how the, the ultimate tax may end up being paid at the end of the day. And from a, you know, there's two primary areas that we're hearing a lot from clients currently. One I know we'll talk about in a bit is what does the future of taxation look like uh, given the change in administration? Uh, but we'll reserve that for a moment. But another current topic that's getting a lot of attention is the our PPP loans. That's the Paycheck Protection Program, which was a you know a lending facility through the Small Business Administration. And there's a couple of you know quirks to that that are particularly troublesome at the moment. Uh, one, on the positive side, those loans were intended, if used for their, you know, for their purpose of rent, payroll, et cetera, to, um, to be forgiven ultimately by the SBA so that the, we're not, you know, our uh, recipients of those loans ultimately don't need to pay those back. The pitch is that IRS is now claiming that any of the expenses you use for, you know, by use of those PPP funds will not be deductible if your loan is forgiven. And so there is a lot of tension about that topic currently. Otherwise, you essentially are leaving people in the position of utilizing funds that were told to them, promised to them to be tax-free, but without taking deductions for the use of the money, they end up receiving the loan proceeds, spending it on their intended purpose, and end up with a tax bill at the end. So there's been a lot of discussion around that topic currently. So uh, if I understand that right, if say if someone has a manufacturing plant, they, they use that loan to buy a new piece of equipment, 
uh, to keep the business going or something, uh, they would then have to pay taxes on that equipment. Is that sort of what you're saying? Well, not exactly. I mean, that would be true, but the you're required to use the vast majority of the funds you receive towards rent utilities and personnel costs. So if you do use them for those purposes, let's say you use it all for personnel costs to keep people employed, which was the purpose of the program, to keep people in business. If you use all the proceeds towards payroll costs, it, ideally those would all be forgiven. You have to apply back to the SBA, give them various proof of things, but subsequently that loan would be forgiven. And in this case, based on what IRS is currently proposing or what they're saying the rule is, you would have received the money, you would ultimately be forgiven, hopefully, because you used it for the proper purpose, but you can't deduct the expenses that you used to pay those costs or for the cost you paid, and therefore you end up with a tax bill at the end because you don't get to use those against the income you were bringing in by keeping your business open. And, and so what are you telling your clients at the moment? Well, <clears throat> the, the quirk is right now you can't, pardon me, you can't take a deduction for those items, but Congress is aware of this. And in fact, there's a bill currently out uh, that's been proposed that would fix this because con Congress has made it clear that their intent for the PPP loan program was for them not to be, uh, you know, for those expenses to be deductible. And so there's a bill pending, but Congress is the only one who can change this position. So without a passage of a bill that incorporates that change, you can't take the deduction. So what we're advising people is currently, they may need to delay potentially when they file their business returns until we have clear evidence and a passage of a law that will put us back to where we're supposed to be. Wedding on Congress, that's a familiar refrain in, uh, in, the, in the world of uh, business. Uh, Chris, let's, uh, let's go back to you uh, and of course, Kelly, you're more than welcome to join in as well. But um, Chris, what do you see as the issues that may cause the most friction both in Austin and in Washington that, that will impact Texas, particularly North Texas? Uh, you bet. Uh, of course, right now on the federal side is the continued, the continuous resolution to, to, to keep the government open, right? We're hearing a lot about that. Uh, that, that deadline is looming. Uh, first and foremost, like I mentioned before, and just to uh, build on what Kelly was talking about is the uh, continued response and recovery uh, to COVID. Uh, what are we doing to continue to address uh, our most stressed industries? Fort Worth based American Airlines. Uh, we must continue to uh, have economic relief for those most stressed industries, whether it be the aviation industry, whether it be our airports, uh, whether it be small business, whether it be hospitality, whether it be the nonprofit sector, the performing arts. Uh, there are so many sectors who are thriving, but there are many, many industries who are really suffering right now. And we must, uh, we must help them. Uh, we must give them the assistance. Uh, our economy in Texas, our economy in North Texas depends on that. And so these are jobs. These are, these are, these are job creator um, sectors and industries, businesses that uh, our residents rely on. So that's first, first and foremost. You know, we have four new members of Congress in our North Texas delegation of 13. Uh, we're working very closely with those four new members of Congress uh, and uh, giving them and their uh, new staff information. Uh, we just had our federal fly in virtually the last two days, it ended yesterday had a majority of our congressional delegation as well as uh, Senators Cornyn and Cruz join us. And you know what we heard Robert over and over again is um, obviously the 9 billion plus um, economic uh, relief and uh, assistance uh, that Congress uh, is, is considering now is that the two major uh, sticking points are um, uh, liability relief. I would love to hear Kelly's take on that. Uh, liability relief, as well as uh, assistance to local governments. And we must provide assistance uh, to local governments. One, we have to protect businesses, first and foremost, who are doing the right thing by their employees and safe distancing and masking, uh, who are following uh, strict protocols of the CDC. We don't want them to be held liable and have lawsuit after lawsuit after all this is over. 
two right now, we, we have to make sure cities are included in that economic relief package uh, that is pending right now. Uh, cities are many of our larger employers throughout our, enti our entire region and our counties. So uh, we must help them uh, during this time. They are playing a crucial role in our recovery and providing services and we frankly must reimburse them. So particularly cities under 500 uh, in population, 500,000 in population, which were not uh, uh, a lot of recipients of the first CARES Act, unless that was through the county. Like Tarrant County was great in helping cities in this last CARES uh, round, but uh, that, that is not the case across the entire region. It's certainly not the case statewide. Uh, a little bit, uh, uh, Rob, you may jump in on the state side or, or do you want Kelly to respond on the federal side first? Uh, uh, yeah, why don't we do that? And, and maybe, uh, I don't know if you, they've done any compromise at all on the liability issue. I know that was really the big sticking point previously. If you have any comment on that. Yeah, uh, and Kelly may know more about it, but that's uh, to what I follow. And many of you receive our daily federal updates from our lobby team in DC. And for what they, they tell me on a daily basis that that is still one of the biggest sticking points is the, um, um, the liability, the, uh, that portion of it, and then funding, of course, uh, to our uh, uh, relief to our local cities, our local governments. All right, uh, before I go to Kelly, I want to remind uh, our participants that uh, if you want to ask a question, there's a Q&A button down at the bottom of your uh, Zoom, and uh, just to, to send those in, we'll We'll be glad to look at them and try to get them answered. Uh, Kelly, uh, you want to talk a little bit about the liability issue? I do. I, I don't, unfortunately, have a whole lot more to add than what Chris has already said. I, I am hearing and, and seeing the same information that he is. I agree that that's a critical element. Um, you know, if I'm a business owner, I've got serious concerns if I'm not going to have some degree of protection from these efforts I'm making but I have not seen anything yet that gives me any comfort that that's moving towards a, a reasonable resolution. Yeah, um, I, I, I think my, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, waiting waiting for Congress is just sort of what we have to do. Um, uh, while we're talking about that, Kelly, why don't you, you talk about a little bit about tax policy and what you see happening in that area? Happy to do so. Um, seems to me there's really kind of two questions we need to, to look at. One, I mentioned it previously, and I, I think we'll, we'll cover it again in, in a bit, is policy going forward, i.e. what does a new administration look like? How are those sort of things going to work? And the short answer to that, we'll cover it in further detail, is no surprise to anyone, taxes are going up and have to go up because at some point we're going to have to pay for all the stimulus and support items that we're doing now. While those are all very worthwhile endeavors and critical elements for you know, our population, we do have to pay for that at some stage. And so uh, I don't anticipate we're gonna have a bunch of cost cutting measures in the future. And if someone has information to the contrary, I'd love to know about that. But I do anticipate that you know, the federal treasury revenues are going to have to go up. But the other piece I want to cover about tax policy is to make sure everyone on the webinar is aware of some things that have been done already. And so the, you know, for those not uh, intimately familiar with the tax code, uh, there was a bill, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. It was the Trump tax law, um, and it made a number of changes to the tax code. And you know, I suspect everyone has heard some degree of that through the course of the election and so on. But with the pandemic, there was an act passed called the CARES Act. And that CARES Act did have a number of tax provisions that are important for business owners to know. And so one of those is that net operating losses. So if you have a business operation and you lose money in a given tax year, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, I'm gonna call it TICJA going forward, but TICJA limited your ability to utilize those losses. You couldn't carry them backwards to prior tax years where you've paid tax, you could only carry them forward. And when you carried them forward, you were limited to only being able to use 80% of or offset 80% of your income in the future years by losses you carried forward. 
And the CARES Act has removed those limitations. So if you have a business loss for 2018, 19, or 2020, you're allowed to carry those back and get a refund of taxes that you've already paid. So as a cash flow mechanism, if you've experienced a loss for 18 or 19 in your business, or if you anticipate that 2020, you know, given all of our variety of issues for this year, will cause that, know that you have the opportunity to go back and capture some prior paid taxes sooner than you would get benefit from just carrying that forward to offset future taxes. Another item I want to make sure everybody knows about uh, is something called qualified improvement property. This is one of those kind of inside taxation sort of things. It's a, it was a weird arrangement where uh, TIGJA had said that for uh, improvement property, qualified improvement property, which are interior building improvements for a non-residential building, that those are supposed to be 15 year properties. You could deduct, you know, deduct them, depreciate them over a quicker time span. And you were able to take bonus depreciation on those. Because of a, a mess up in the writing of the law for TIGJA, those ended up being treated as 39 year assets. And so you couldn't get accelerated benefits. Well, the CARES Act fixed that. And so for improvements that you made for 2018 and 19, you need to convert to now treating those as 15 year property that should result in a acceleration of tax deductions for you and piggybacking on the prior comment, perhaps it even drives you to a loss in 2018 or 19, which you could then carry back to a prior tax year and capture. Um, but if you've not made any adjustments and you have that type of property, so interior improvements for a non-residential building, you want to look at that and see if there's ability to capture some tax benefit currently. Another item uh, is if you incur interest expense within your business, the TICJA uh, limited your ability to claim those losses to 30% of your adjusted income. Uh, the CARES Act expanded that, so now it's a 50% limit. So again, giving, trying to get more uh, cash in people's pockets by having them pay less in tax currently. And then lastly, if you're a business owner and you own your business, not in a C corporation, a tax paying entity, but through an S corporation or a partnership, there were limitations at your personal level if you had losses over certain amounts in your personal return. And those limitations have been removed as well. So if you were haircut in 2018 or 19 for returns you've already filed, you want to look at that as well, because that may be another place you could capture some, some money on taxes you've already paid. Oh, that, that's very interesting. So, so there's actually some uh, some ways you can recover some revenue that, that you may have lost in previous years. There. Yeah. Yes, sir. I've uh, got a question here. And it's, it's, it's sort of on topic of what we're talking about. A question, any ideas on what the second round of small business relief bill might include? Do you want to go first, Chris? Uh, Kelly, you're probably best to answer that. Okay, well, I, I'm envisioning that there will be additional PPP funding. So this round of loans that were made initially, you know, had a total dollar limitation that was allowed and those that limitation was burned through pretty quickly, you know, and you need to be first in line to be able to be sure you got any bite at the apple. So I envision that there will be further PPP uh, loan facility that would be structured. And, you know, the piece, I guess it's, there a lot of it's up in the air, but, you know, will it be for only people who haven't previously been able to utilize the loan? You know, all the details of what that loan process might look like, uh, I haven't seen enough to know the, the particulars, but I do anticipate that a, another loan regime will be part of that process. Chris? In my note, uh, I'm looking here that I just received this morning of the 908 billion a relief proposal, there's 288 billion in support for small businesses. Uh, 168 in local aid. Let me just read you some of these that are more the higher amounts. Uh, 16 billion for healthcare needs, testing, tracing, and vaccine distribution. Uh, some money for childcare, rental assistance. Uh, 10 billion for broadband support, which is part of our federal and state legislative agenda, which is much, much needed. Some transit agency support, agriculture, nutrition, um, student loan relief, and some money for the U.S. Postal Service. There's, and you, you 
can find a lot of this too. Um, uh, I noticed, thank you for putting our website on there. Uh, much of this is on our website and you can chat with me. I'll be happy to, uh, to share our federal resources uh, to you on a daily basis. Hey, you mentioned technology infrastructure and maybe this goes back to tax policy, but uh, it's always been a sticking point uh, in previous years about uh, basically taking off the cost of a home office. Uh, any ideas on, on how that's going to be treated this year, Kelly? I haven't seen anything new on that. The, you know, one part of the issue is a home office, um, we've typically found in a lot of instances, doesn't end up moving the needle very far, unfortunately. Um, you know, that's been one of the, the bigger hangups is that, you know, for instance, you can take depreciation related to the office space you have, but if your office is you know, 100 square feet in your home, you're out, you're apportioning the cost of your home across the entirety of your square footage. So you only have a small amount potentially that you can take related to the footage size. Now, to the extent you could take, you know, utilities or taxes, you know, allocable shares of taxes or interest, that could be helpful. But uh, typically that's not a huge mover has been my general experience. I certainly want people to claim every dollar they're entitled to get but it's it's typically not one that saves a ton of money. And, and speaking of stimulus money, I, I, I know that Texas still has some CARES Act funds yet to be spent. Um, and I, I think I heard uh, Fort Worth this morning was looking at using some for rental assistance and such. Uh, it, Chris, this is probably for you. Do you have any idea how, how these funds that are left will, will still be doled out by the end of the year? Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of questions around that. Uh, from what I understand, there's about $2 billion of the $11.24 billion that Texas received uh, that must be used by um, the end of the year or just a few days before the end of the year. So uh, that's, that's, that's a question. Uh, yeah. No doubt, uh, I think the governor and his team are doing a great job of managing uh, this pandemic under the circumstances. And uh, I have no doubt that uh, two billion dollars will be uh, allocated to various agencies. We've seen some allocation for TEA. We've seen some allocation for Health and Human Services. Uh, we've seen some allocation for uh, obviously uh, uh, direct uh, response uh, and recovery to COVID. Uh, and I think it'll continue all along that line. There, there has been some talk about uh, uh, if Congress uh, gives the extension, then could some of that money be used uh, to uh, help with our roughly $4 billion or so to date, from what I understand, potential shortfall in the next uh, session uh, for the next biennium. So uh, I've heard that as well, but um, it's, um, it is a question. But I, I have no doubt it's going to be managed well and that it will be distributed prior to the deadline if it's not extended. Uh, another question from our attendees. Uh... I think this is probably for Kelly. Any chance that unreimbursed employee expenses will be added back so they could be deducted once again? Well, I do think that's possible. That is, uh, you know, it's another instance where, you know, a bill has been proposed with respect to that particular topic. Um, you know, there was one in the, in the prior session, in fact, that, um, it ha I haven't seen a ton of momentum on that, that that's something it's not, I don't think it's nearly as, um, as much of a, a lead item as for instance, the uh, forgiveness, the deductibility of, ex of forgiveness uh, loans on PPP, but it is something that Congress is aware of. And so I think it's gonna be you know, part of that general thing you've talked about of how the sausage is made and, and what happens in Washington and waiting on something to happen there are people who want that reinstated, but whether or not that will happen as part of this process is just too hard to tell. I've not seen a specific inclusion of that topic in current, you know, in the current relief package. Uh, Chris, you, and you can both answer this. Chris mentioned this earlier about uh, basically health issues. Uh, seems like we're always on pins and needles in terms of the government policy toward health care. Uh, for nearly 10 years, it feels like. Uh, what, what do you see as the future of health care and employee benefits looking like, uh, particularly with the new administration? I 
think this is going to be uh, a top priority for the new administration. Uh, I think it's going to be a top discussion item in our state legislature coming up, uh, specifically uh, around recapturing our Medicaid dollars that we send to DC. Uh, we must bring those back home to Texas. Uh, we have too many uh, uninsured Texans today. Uh, this pandemic has shed even more, unfortunately, a light on that. Uh, uh, of, uh, we are only one of 12 states that has not expanded Medicaid. Uh, and unfortunately, we are uh, one of the highest, and not by a little bit, but a lot, highest uh, state uh, out of all 50 states in terms of uninsured rate. So uh, we must tackle that issue. Uh, there are, there's are some new data out there. Uh, that is uh, now being released by some very respected uh, economists. Uh, they have studied this issue. They've studied other uh, states uh, who are led by conservative, um, uh, primarily Republican leaders uh, in terms of the statewide offices. And they have been able in those states to, to manage their own plan, their own um, structured plan that works for their state. We can do the same in Texas. Uh, Senator Johnson has a bill. There will be several other bills filed, uh, but, but, but I would encourage people to, to look at the new data uh, that these economists uh, are projecting. And um, there's some data that even says that uh, recapturing our dollars could be a net gain back to the state. In a time where we do have a shortfall uh, and we need to be looking at other sources of revenue, this may be a source of revenue or at least if it's even a, um, uh, a flat outcome, if you will, uh, I, I think it's certainly worth discussing. Uh, we're seeing that uh, bipartisan discussion now across the entire state that while in the past it has not been a discussion item, uh, I think it will be this next session. Plus, uh, our waiver 1115, uh, although we understand that the state has just or is about to submit uh, a request for an extension, uh, but the waiver, 11, the waiver 1115, which is so, so important, to our hospitals, and we must have a continuation of that. Uh, that is expiring, and there's no guarantee that uh, the Center for Medicaid Services will, will grant that waiver again to Texas. So, hey, can you explain that what that waiver is? Yeah, the waiver is is uh, all about um, a hospital financing. It it, it deals with uh, funding related to uncompensated care, and it helps uh, not certainly make whole, but it does certainly help our hospitals. Uh, and we've been relying on that uh, to, to reimburse our hospitals for quite some time. Uh, we must continue that. Our hospitals are too, too important to us uh, in this region across the state everywhere. And uh, no better time now are we realizing, uh, probably long overdue, the, the importance of our facilities and the staff who house those facilities. Uh, uh, they are uh, golden to us right now. We must protect that. Do you have any suggestions on how, how business leaders can get involved in this discussion on the, on health care at the state uh, level? Call me. Uh, let me know. We, where we, are, we are working with several of our uh, Chamber of Commerce partners from around the region with several coalitions that we manage. Uh, and there's some statewide coalitions building around Medicaid expansion, recapturing our dollars. Uh, call it what you want, uh, our own Texas plan, but uh, the fact of the matter is, is that we must have those discussions. Uh, and I think we'll see more legislation too that is going to be filed that, that there's some good ideas out there in terms of how to do that. But we would encourage business participation. You know, like, like we've seen on issues in the past that could be detrimental to our state and our business friendly environment, which we must, must protect that in our state. That is our niche that many states do not have. And that's why companies and their employees continue to move here is because we are business friendly. So we must um, make sure that we're a state open to everyone and we must uh, be a healthy state and uh, Medicaid expansion will go a long way in that. So please do contact us, uh, send me a note in the chat box to capture your email, uh, your phone number, and I'll be sure to get you uh, engaged in that coalition. Kelly, uh, any uh, tax implementation Locations of healthcare this year and, and employee benefits as well? Not that I know of. The I think the bigger question, the longer term question, will be kind of a philosophical discussion. You know, one one constant issue 
that's been raised is the tax allowance, the benefit that people get from not being, you know, taxed. Cor employers deducting cost of healthcare for their employees and uh, the in individuals not being taxed thereon, and the idea of breaking from having a employer-based healthcare system to something more universal. And so I think until we've got further movement down that track, that there's probably not a whole lot that, that I would envision is going to change with respect to healthcare taxation. There may be things around the margin, you know, how much you can put into a health savings account or into a flexible spending account or things like that. But I don't envision there being any material changes in that regard until we've had kind of broader change to the healthcare delivery system. All right, uh, and this one I suspect is for Chris. Uh, just wondered if you could sort of explain uh, the redistricting process that we're gonna go through this year and, and sort of how and, and if businesses and individuals could get involved. Yeah, no, um, uh, we are fortunate, just like we have uh, Senator Nelson, uh, head of Senate Finance and uh, Chairman Capriccione uh, in the House uh, uh, on appropriation and they uh, have done a great job uh, and will do a great job of structuring our budget. Uh, on the redistricting side, uh, we also have in our, in our region, uh, Chairman Phil King and Vice Chairman uh, uh, Chris Parker um, have done uh, a, an outstanding job of uh, asking the public to engage on redistricting. And this has been several months ago. Uh, they had several field hearings. We were engaged in many of them within our 13 county region, but they held these all over the state to get feedback on redistricting. And basically just, just in a nutshell in terms of the process. So you, so you have these field hearings, you gather public data, public uh, comment, uh, then it goes to the legislature and there will be bills filed just like any other bill filed during this next session. Uh, there are already many, many bills already filed. Uh, we're not seeing a shortage of those like, like, um, uh, like predicted during this time. It'll go through the legislative process uh, in the House, in the Senate. Uh, those bills will be debated just like any other bill. Uh, if uh, it is not acted on by the legislature uh, and then signed by the governor or not, or, or, or vetoed, or, or he doesn't act and then it's automatically vetoed, then it goes to the legislative redistricting board. And uh, that, that board is made up of our Lieutenant Governor, uh, uh, our Speaker of the House, uh, uh, Speaker-elect Phelan, and then uh, our Attorney General, our Comptroller, and our Commissioner of the General Land Office, so uh, Commissioner Bush. And so uh, if the board, and hopefully at that point, the board will, will, will uh, address it and resolve any issues. If not, uh, then it goes to the courts, obviously. Uh, it'll go through a judicial review anyway, uh, prior to uh, uh, becoming final. Uh, in terms of how our new districts uh, are drawn at the state and congressional level uh, as well. This is for the legislature, this is for the State Board of Education, and this is for Congress. So it's, a, it's an interesting process. We go through it every 10 years. Uh, Robert, let me pause here and thank everybody uh, who is joining us today for completing the census. Uh, this is one reason why the census was uh, very, very important. And we were happy and proud to take a lead in making sure that we had a, about a 65% self-response rate in our region. You couple that with the great work that the census uh, team has done, the staff, uh, and uh, we have a 90, just over a 99% completion rate. So we ended up well, and, and we thought that was not gonna be the case. So it was all hands on deck there for several, several months to get a complete count. So I think Texas will end up uh, with our complete count with uh, two, maybe even four um, uh, congressional seats. And we're gonna see some of that right here in our great region as well. So that's, that's very important. Other states are gonna be losing members of Congress. And so the population is decreasing while our population is increasing. We all know that uh, and we're proud of that. Now, now we have to make sure that uh, we keep our state business friendly and open to everyone. Yeah, that, that census was a little bit of a nail biter. So that, that's good to know that we got got that done. Uh, it, you know, in the, in the last few Texas legislative sessions, there's been a lot, maybe more than a lot of tension between the state government and local government. 
uh, over control. Uh, got a new speaker of the house in, in Austin. Uh, is that going to change things? What do you see happening there? Yeah, um, cities uh, were in the firing line this, this last session. It was a beating. Um, we cannot have that again this, this session. Cities are too valuable uh, to our state's economy. They are revenue generators. Uh, we must protect the government that I say, the government that's closest to the people, uh, to be frank. Uh, our local government uh, with, with the services that they provide, uh, these local government leaders are responsible uh, and they must be obviously held accountable and they are uh, by the people who elect them but uh, we must establish the appropriate means to adequately fund their services and give them the leverage and the authority to do so. Uh, it's no different than what we ask the federal government of our state leaders. And so uh, we need to ask our state leaders the same for our local leaders. And whether it be Fort Worth city and county, whether it be any city and county uh, in our entire region, our government, our local government leaders are doing incredible jobs and in which they are elected to do. And the staff uh, of those governments are doing incredible jobs. So, you know, uh, we were faced with revenue caps uh, last session, uh, unfortunately down to 3.5. Uh, we're asking that the legislature continue uh, to have discussions to uh, look at raising that back up to 6%, uh, not, not the eight, but, but to 6%. We think that's a good compromise. Uh, we are going to be adamantly opposing bad public policy uh, that would stifle uh, our city's ability to communicate with their legislator, and legislators and state agencies during the session, during the interim session, uh, like we're going to see in what has been filed House Bill 749 uh, and Senate Bill uh, 234. That is what was Senate Bill 29 last session, which basically prohibits cities from spending public money to communicate with their legislators and agencies uh, for lobbying efforts. And so you, you hire professionals uh, to, to help uh, get a piece of legislation uh, over the goal line uh, to, uh, to, to defend against bad pieces of legislation, uh, to make sure that uh, there is education to the citizens of those communities about what that is about. And so it's, it's being at the table and involved in the process. So uh, there's a, a bill that passed last session that kind of flew under the radar, 2439, which is about mandating building products. Uh, many cities have expressed concern over that, rightfully so. Uh, many of our 50 uh, state legislators have said that they want to relook at that. Uh, and so I think that will hopefully certainly be on the table. Um, we have seven new um, House members in our region. Uh, so uh, of our 41 members of our House, we have seven who are new and we'll be getting a new senator here uh, in the runoff election. Uh, one of our nine senators will be new. So uh, nine Senate and 41 House members make up the 50 of our state legislators. So we're happy to work with each of them. They all do great jobs on behalf of our region. And uh, Any uh, big uh, committee memberships and such in our for our local legislators? Yeah, of course, you know, we've got uh, Chairman Capriccion, we've got Chairwoman Nelson in the Senate, uh, we've got Parker, uh, we've got uh, King, we've got uh, uh, several who hold key committee chairmanships uh, in our region. Uh, I, I, I hope that'll continue. Uh, publicly, I think I last saw there were about 83 plus perhaps a few more who signed on early on uh, to support uh, the presumptive speaker Phelan, and uh, about just over 20 of those are from our region. And so, uh, you know, you might look at some of that for potential um, uh, chairmanships of committees as well. But we're 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 in good shape. Uh, our uh, our delegation of 50 uh, understand the issues, uh, the top 10 issues that we and our chambers and our cities and our counties all agreed on that are the top 10 issues of our region. We are unified, I call it our unified megaphone. We are unified even more than we wore last session. We wore a lot last session, uh, but this is new. Uh, the commission is now taking the lead on uh, uh, being uh, that manager of that state and federal 
a legislative voice for our 13 counties. And so we've got the top 10 issues. Uh, there are about total 59 issues that our North Texas Commission Board is uh, or has acted on. Uh, but there are our top 10 that we uh, are building coalitions around today. Uh, you mentioned the new uh, Texas Speaker of the House. Can, can you give us a little background on uh, him, Dave Phelan, I think is his name? Dave Phelan, yeah, from Beaumont. Uh, good guy, uh, great leader. Uh, he is seen as a, uh, a consensus builder, uh, brings everybody to the table. Uh, you may agree to disagree, but um, uh, I think we'll see that this, this certainly this next session. Um, uh, from what I understand from Chambers and others who have worked closer with him down in his area, he's very fair. Uh, we did see him uh, author a few bills this last session, which are a little concerning, like 2439 that I mentioned. Uh, but hopefully as speaker, he will be a convener. Uh, and realizes uh, the bipartisanship that is so important. And, and we've seen that thus far in terms of those signing on uh, to, to support the vote the first day of the session uh, when they elect him as speaker and then set the new rules, which are gonna be very important in this next session in terms of the access to the Capitol. I have a more a comment than a question, but it sort of mirrors what you were saying, Chris. It says, uh, from anonymous attendee, uh, while we are keeping our state Business, business friendly, how can we do a better job of being citizen friendly? It seems that we had to fight to ensure people are not disenfranchised and to provide health care for everyone. There must be a balance, which is Absolutely. sort of what you were saying. Yeah, no, uh, and that participant nailed it. Uh, there, there has to be a balance. Everybody has to be welcomed and feel welcomed and have a part. And um, a big part of that is job creation and health. Uh, you have creation of jobs, you have a healthy climate, uh, healthy employees uh, who can get a job and keep a job and be productive at a job. That's, that, that is the success uh, of our region and our state. Uh, but uh, everybody must have that equal opportunity. There is no doubt. Uh, and so uh, that is the underlying common denominator no matter who you are. And so um, we've got the leadership uh, in our region who are looking at uh, some of those difficult uh, pieces of legislation that are gonna be discussed this next session on criminal justice reform, on racial inequities, on making sure that uh, we are friendly in terms of LGBTQ individuals, uh, the, the list goes on and on, but everybody must have a place at the table and feel welcome in our state uh, and certainly in our region. So. Uh, Charlie Guerin is another one, uh, you're talking about chairmanships that is uh, doing a good job right now, making sure that uh, how we physically function at the Capitol this next session, given COVID is gonna be very, how we do business, how we convene uh, in terms of the legislature uh, and those who uh, help educate our legislators and our public and private sector leaders to educate our legislators, like what we do here at the commission and what the great job the Fort Worth Chamber does. So. We all must continue to work together. It's going to be a difficult session. I, I think Charlie was there before the Capitol was actually there. So. Um, Kelly, it's, it's getting near the end of the year. And so uh, you're with one of the biggest CPA firms in the country. Uh, so do you have any tax tips for individuals or businesses as we, as we near the end of the year? I do. Thanks. Um, and I, some of the comments are uh, need to be prefaced with the potential changes for the new administration. So based on proposals we've seen to date, uh, you know, business rates have been proposed, corporate uh, tax rates have been proposed to be raised from 21% to 28%. Individuals, the highest tax rates have been proposed to be raised from 37% to 39.6%. Uh, both of those would take us back to pre uh, tickja amounts. There's also for uh, individuals who are receiving dividends, there, currently there's a preferential rate on dividends that are received and that's been uh, playing, you know, potentially will be removed as well. And so what I wanted to advise corporate uh, folks who work at own corporations, C corporations precisely, uh, you know, the, the combination of those changes, if you were a person who had just for, you know, simple numbers, $100 worth of income and you want to take everything out that you could 
through dividends. Dividends aren't deductible, so you pay tax on your $100 at the corporate rate. You then receive the net of proceeds and pay tax on that at your individual rate. And currently, you pay 39.8% on that $100 example. Um, 39, you know, four, call it 40% combined tax between your personal and the corporate. With the proposed changes, that would go from 40% up to 59% between the raises of the corporate and the dividend rates. So that's something to be aware of that you know, while nothing has passed yet, that that's, should be on your mind as a potential concern. And you know, given that as the backdrop, the, the biggest part for planning, I think really derives on what your thoughts are about the Georgia special elections for the Senate. If those both go Democrat and then uh, Kamala Harris is able to be the tie-breaking vote in the Senate, then you should expect tax rates are going up. If that's true, you would look to uh, accelerate, pardon me, you know, uh, you know, defer potentially deductions to next year. If you're thinking about, do I pay something at year end? You're now trying to balance the time value of money between receiving a deduction today but at 21% versus deducting it next year, but at 28%. And unfortunately, the election's not till after year end, so you will have already had to make that choice as to whether you've paid those expenses. So that to me is the biggest wild card is just what's your, what's your viewpoint on where you think the election is going to go in Georgia. Um, you know, beyond that, things to look out for, you know, there's been a lot of talk about trying to reinstate the state and local tax deduction so that we're not limited on property taxes here or in uh, California, New York, other high income tax states. They're not limited on their deductions for their state income taxes. I suspect that's something that uh, would be passed pretty quickly if the Democrats have control of the, of the levers of government. Another thing I would just caution everyone is, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the ability to claim to carry back losses, do check to see that you've got any potential items based on those CARES Act changes that if you've not already taken advantage of them, see if you have anything that, that fits in those buckets, because that's money you could get back in your pocket quicker than using those losses in future years. Well, that, that's a great, that's a great tip. Um, I, it would be remiss in Texas to talk about um, legislature sessions and not talk about immigration that's a that's just a key issue for the state chris can you give us any indication of what you're seeing maybe that might happen federal or statewide with immigration you bet no thank you for that question we are heavily engaged on comprehensive immigration reform first and foremost i think a permanent fix to the daca program is in order uh we just uh, uh had a call recently on our federal flying with uh, Senator Cornyn. Uh, he's still taking a lead on this. Uh, it is a bipartisan effort, uh, but uh, please uh, uh, engage on this issue. I, I really think that a permanent fix to the DACA program uh, will be a great stepping stone to, uh, you know, let's, let's fix that program and show that this can be done. Uh, and that would be a great stepping stone to more comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, if we just look at our North Texas region, there are 1.4 million, 1.4 million immigrants just within our region. Of that, there are 575,000 undocumented immigrants and 92,000 dreamers. So let's start with protecting those 92,000 dreamers. They are high school graduates. Uh, well over the majority of them have jobs. Uh, they are productive citizens, and we need those workers. It is uh, huge for our future economic impact. So first and foremost is DACA. We're seeing a bipartisan effort now in the, in the House and Senate. We, we actually have uh, economic impact data that we have shared with uh, Congresswoman Granger and uh, Congressman Vesey, who is also a champion on this project and this initiative, and all of our uh, 13 members of Congress, we have shared economic impact data with on um, what is exactly the economic impact of immigrants living in their district. Um, how much do they pay in state and federal taxes? How many have jobs? And so this is great data that they're armed with now. And it is, a, it is an economic impact uh, vote 
And so uh, we must uh, accomplish DACA first and then address our over, uh, overall immigrant population, which is vitally important to our region and our state. And, and uh, what about the, the visa program that, that some of the technology industries use? Uh, you bet. Yeah, no, thank you for asking that. Uh, the H-1B visas and other visa programs, uh, STEM related, are highly, highly important. Uh, we have seen a decrease of the number allowed over the last couple of years. Uh, I hope the new administration will um, uh, take a hard look at that because many of our industries, and not just the technology and communication industries, but many across our entire region rely on those immigrant workers. Uh, now, keep in mind, these are immigrant workers who are uh, very uh, highly skilled, highly specialized, many of them, and they are helping uh, all immigrants help uh, really augment our uh, workforce, not replace American jobs. They help augment our workforce, and we must have it all. Uh, not only American workers well-trained, and we're doing that through our great education systems, uh, and bringing up that pipeline, that workforce pipeline, which is our number one challenge and our number one issue that needs to be faced outside of COVID relief this next session is continuation of HB3 and sustaining HB3 is highly important to our Texas economy and our workforce pipeline. So immigrants are a big part of that. There are teachers, there are doctors, there are scientists, there are frontline workers through this body and this pandemic. Uh, one, uh, certainly the pandemic has made a lot of changes to education uh, and what's happening there. Education funding is always an issue in the legislative session. Is is that will that continue to be an issue? And are there any any issues there? I don't, uh, I don't think so. Uh, if you just in terms of our 50 that we are working with very closely uh, across the board, we've heard that sustaining the success of the landmark legislation of HB3 is a top priority. Uh, obviously, next to COVID uh, recovery and relief, and so um, economic recovery. So. That's a, a sustaining HB3 and funding that is, is very, very important. Also maintaining formula funding to our institutions of higher education is also critical and hopefully reimbursing uh, the 5% uh, cut that they uh, faced as well uh, if, if the budget allows. All right, uh, just got a few minutes uh, left here. I uh, wonder if uh, y'all would like to have a couple of final thoughts. Uh, Kelly, you you want to reiterate anything that you've said already? Happy to. Um, and again, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity of being on the panel today. Um, in the interest of time, my, my quick tip would be review your prior tax returns that you filed for 2018 and 19 and make sure that you've gotten all of the benefits that you're entitled to with respect to uh, you know, any of the changes that have been made in the law, and then you can be best positioned to know what you're dealing with for 2020 as well, prior to the end of this tax year. That's, that's the best tax tip I've heard. I, I, so you people that you get this free webinar and you get a tax tip that may get money in your pocket. So I'd say that's a win-win. Thank, thanks, Kelly. Chris? Thank you. Yeah, no, just just three other quick points in the states. Uh, next session of the legislature that I'll bring up. One is broadband. I mentioned that uh, highly needed that we have connectivity. There are a lot of uh, areas, even across metropolitan areas, not just rural areas of our of our region and our state, but large metropolitan areas that still uh, a better broadband is in order. And so, uh, uh, helping to make sure that that our telecommunications companies. Uh, are assisted in that effort is, is certainly key. Um, making sure that we have all the economic development tools to be able to recruit businesses here. Chapter 313 is up for reauthorization this next session. And so our chambers are working very hard on that as well. That is highly important to our economic development success in the future. Uh, and so uh, those are uh, you know, um, certainly a couple of issues that I wanted to bring up uh, related to the next session. Uh, yeah, that economic development one is, is... I know there were some sticking points the last time that was up. Uh, does that look like that will go through again, or are there some changes there? Uh, Speaker Bonham did his best to try to uh, pair uh, Chapter 312, which was up for reauthorization last session in the 86, and bring in 313 at the same time. 
uh, that didn't work. And so now 313 is up for reauthorization. This is the incentive package, uh, contractual um, uh, incentive package that our school districts use. So that's gonna be very important. I think it, it certainly needs to be tweaked. We're, we're working on that, but uh, uh, let's, let's don't do away with those tools. Uh, we, we must have those tools. Uh, uh, another one, Robert, that we must uh, do a better job at is the use of P3s, public-private partnerships. And particularly in a time where we are looking at a uh, needed uh, new sources of revenue, let, let's, let's bring in private sector money uh, on transportation projects uh, to make sure that we uh, maintain and that we fund new uh, projects around our region. We, we have a great infrastructure here, COG and others, Michael Morris and others do a great job in making sure that we have a successful integrated transportation system of choice, uh, of choice, meaning tollways as well, managed lanes that are so important to that system. And so P3s will go a long way in that. All right. Well, uh, I want to thank our, our panelists. I, I really appreciate uh, all your information and uh, we, uh, we have a one pager from the North Texas Commission uh, about issues in the legislature that, that we're going to send to all everyone who registered. So um, you'll have that. And of course, you can contact uh, the North Texas Commission and contact BKD. Uh, if you if you pull out your 2018 taxes and have some questions and figure that out. And uh, with that, I, I I just want to thank you and thank the participants and uh, uh, appreciate your time. Thank you all for joining. Kelly, thank you. Rich, Robert, good to be with you, sir. Thank, thank you very you much. Thank you. Appreciate it.